Hereby call the City of Charlestown City Council meeting of the 1st of July 2019 to order. Please stand for a moment of silence and the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, the approval of the minutes, there's a couple of uh, corrections to the minutes. If you would please turn to page two, packet page number four, and then 3349, we're talking about the Chesapeake Bay Watershed implement, Implementation Plan presentation. If you're on about two-thirds of the way down the paragraph, you'll see the chemical spill in Charlestown. That's actually a chemical spill in Charleston. So that would be a correct for that. I think it was the Elk River. And if we can continue on to packet page number five, under new business 3393, the last sentence, uh, basically we're talking about swearing in the newly elected council members, sworn into office by the city clerk instead of the city manager, Daryl Hennessy. Those two corrections, are there any other corrections? Hearing none, uh, hereby uh, uh, acknowledge that the uh, the, the minutes are approved from the, the meeting of June the 17th, 2019. So we're going to just change up the order just a little bit. Um, one of the things is that Mayor Pro Tem, my uh, real honor to do is to administer oaths of office. So I um, have one to do. Yep. Uh, well, I'll introduce uh, Mary. Could you step up here? Mary Prelude, she lives here in Jefferson County. She was just recently hired to replace uh, Shirley as our uh, parking enforcement employee. Uh, so with that, we need to get her sworn in to the office, so go that way. Yeah. Shirley was with us for 14 years, so now Mary is going to fill that role, hopefully for a long time as well. Okay. Please raise your right hand. Hi, state your name. I am Ford. You solemnly swear that I will support. I solemnly swear that I will support. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution. The Constitution of the State of West Virginia. Solemnly swear, solemnly swear that I will faithfully discharge, will faithfully discharge and perform the duties of the position, and perform the duties of, the position of parking enforcement, of parking enforcement to the best of my skill and judgment according to law. To the best of my skill and judgment according to law. Okay, do we have people signed up for public comment? So let's go, well we have 16 people signed up for 20 minutes, so we'll go 90 seconds per comment. All right, first speaker is Raymond Bruning, followed by Dan Casto. Good evening, thank you. You guys hear me okay? There we go. So let me start by saying uh, uh, thanks for taking the time to listen to all of us tonight, um, and congratulations to all you that have currently just won elections. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm sure it's probably a little bit overwhelming if this is your first council meeting. Um, I don't think they all go like this. Um, and I'm sure you're all aware of the ongoing issues with the sewer. Um, but, uh, you know, this issue should really be behind us. And tonight you have the opportunity to actually put it behind you. Um, so first, while I'm you know, certainly not an attorney, um, I just uh, advise you to, to listen to your legal counsel. 
Um, my understanding is this petition isn't even binding because it's uh, the type of bond being issued by the state is, is not the type of bond that would be uh, valid with this type of petition. Um, second, reopening the issue now would put the entire uh, county uh, and city at risk for future improvements using state bonds. Um, I mean, the state's got to be looking at what's going on here. And, uh, you know, we're going to need more bonds. Harpers Ferry has issues with their water. Um, and if we continue down this path, the state's going to make us find other financing for those for those type of improvements. Um, third, it's also going to put the ratepayers at risk. We all know that. We've all heard that over and over and over. Um, and most of those that probably signed the blue petition weren't told that the risk of their rates would be going up. Um, and it, fourth, do um, you really think it's a good idea to weaponize? Thank you, Mr. Brewing. Next up, Dan Casto and then David. I don't know how to pronounce that name. You know yourself, David. Thank you. So tonight we're here again to discuss the sewer bond. The reality is Rockwell is going to be here. In fact, Jefferson County Vision in its pleadings specifically says Rockwell has a right to sewer service. The only thing that we now have to decide is how are we going to pay for it? Are we going to take the free money from the state of West Virginia? Or are we going to put it on the ratepayers where if Rockwell comes in tomorrow under Rule 5 and demands service, CTUB has to provide it. If they do that, you as a city council and CTUB have to come up with one and a half million dollars, which you do not have. So I encourage you to take the free money from the state. Further, Ranson Elementary School is going to require sewer service and if it's going to be built. And lastly, this city council has already adopted the resolutions necessary to adopt the bond. If you would accept their petition and you're not legally required to, you would be violating the city's charter, which does not require a four-fifths majority vote. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Castell. All right, David Jigmillet. Sorry about that, David. And Ilsa Gregg. So 90 seconds. Sorry. Okay. Uh, my name is David Jigmillet. I've uh, been here in historic Charlestown for about 18 days now. I grew up in uh, Prince William County, two counties over Jefferson County, Loudoun County, Prince William County. Uh, really like it here and I've been trying to kind of get a sense of what's going on in this community and things that are important. I see the Rockwell signs all over town. I read about it in the various papers and magazines and I uh, guess just wanted to share a few observations from maybe a newcomer who not coming from too far away, but doesn't really have a dog in the hunt. And, uh, I guess first, uh, you know, toxicity can come from all different directions, not just formaldehyde. It can come from stride and opposition. And, uh, you know, I would ur urge caution to those who believe too stridently in one side and not, and not have an open mind to other, other things. Uh, Rockwell, from what I've read, provides insulation in homes, a radiant barrier that keeps your house warm in the winter and cool in the summer. This is a product that's useful. It's a corporate moneyed interest, so is McDonald's, so is the Big Mac, so is the pants and belt that I'm wearing. There are, you know, a lot of sides to every, every story. Um, com companies coming from out of town or elsewhere it happen all the time. Thank you, Mr. Gillette. Coal mines. Thank you, sir. Ilsa Gregg and then Barbara Kraft. Hi. Um, I saw an ad recently for a mayor, and it was $4,600 a year, and the resume was to be sent to the city manager. And I started thinking about that. I thought, you get to hire your own boss, or actually that's not your boss. Um, on the JCDA... There was non-disclosure agreements and CTUB. The invisible hand that knows everything that's going on is the city manager. So from it, the way it looks, I'm not saying it's true, it looks like that you all are volunteers and you do what the city manager tells you to do. That's what it looks like. And so I would just say, who's supervising the city manager? Because it looks like from the application, the mayor works for the city manager. And it looks like all you are just good volunteers. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gregg. Oh, sorry. 
Next up, uh, Barbara Kraft and Billy Gard. Okay, um, Barbara Kraft. I've lived in Charlestown, in Charlestown with my husband since 1988. So I have a vested interest in what happens here. Um, I also speak for several other long-term residents, the Kearns and the Ross, I always do. Um, welcome to the new members, congratulations. I just wanted to bring it back to the blue petition. 1,572 people that live within the wards of Charlestown signed that petition asking not for you to not approve the bond or approve the bond. Give us a public hearing. Give everybody a public hearing to voice their opinion about the sewer bond. And let this be between the citizens of Charlestown and their elected city council and nobody else. That's my request. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Billy Gard and then Jamie Gregory. Ninety seconds for a lawyer is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you much, very much for having me speak. I was going to spend a couple minutes talking about the Fourth of July and the importance of the message of "We the People," and the "We the People" is what this really petition is all about. Um, we are asking for you to hear our petition to hear from your citizens. And we believe that we have a right to be heard. We filed a lawsuit, which we didn't want to file, because we want you to hear us. But this, this hearing tonight is not about the substance of that. It's about our right to be heard. And we want you to do that. We want you to hear from all the citizens. I may not agree with the thing that Dan Castro says, but I want you to be able to hear from what he says um, at a hearing. I want you to hear what CTUB says. I want you to hear real information, not vague threats, about what the consequences are and the risks are of where we are now on the sewer bond. But I do want you to hear from us. That's what this lawsuit is about, and it would give me the greatest honor possible to dismiss it if you would give us our hearing. Thank you very much. Yeah. Amy Gregory and Nancy Gregory. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, James Gregory, congratulations to the new members. Um, I've lived in Jefferson County by choice for 41 years and in the city here now for over four down on Liberty Street. Um, I have a couple of things here that Rockwell won't have. This is my water bill, which I pay. Um, the sewer thing seems to be going up. I have to check on that. Um, I also have my business and occupation tax and taxes that I pay. And so I'm, I'm not in favor of giveaways uh, to uh, corporations just because they are corporations and the sewer bond would be a big giveaway. I'd like to have a hearing too um, and get more information. I've tried to follow um, as best I can information that comes out and I still have a lot of questions, especially a lot for CTUB about what's involved and what's going to go into the sewer if it were to be built. And I think a public hearing where those things are actually transparently put out there, not stuff that's passed along or regurgitated, excuse me, and not things that are um, uh, positioned as, well, if we don't do this, you know, all the, um, uh, that just means rates go up. My rates have gone up without it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And then Nancy Gregory and Bill Gillette. So the citizens did not have ample opportunity to key on the decision to sell our county. In Soissin, France, Rockville arranged for five public hearings before signing on to build the factory, which they haven't signed yet. The goal was to inform the population about the project and answer all questions. We got an open house after contractual agreements were signed and since then threats of lawsuits. Now we want our voices heard through a hearing to give our case about, about the sewer bond, about corporate welfare, our tax money. There is no free money. Yes, it's a tax, it's a um, interest-free loan, but where does that bond money come from? Didn't it come from our taxes originally. It certainly didn't come from Governor Justice's tax money or proceeds from the Greenbrier. <laughs> so, so I was going to 
I was going to present Peter Rot Roggenberg's um, Exhibit A, but you'll get copies of it from Sean. So, you know, he just cry, cry, cry because his his uh, company may be a little bit late in in uh, producing their product, and um, let him cry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Bill Gillette and then Sean Amos. Thank you very much for uh, allowing us to speak tonight. Um, I am. I don't have a dog in the hunt. I do live in Jefferson County, and I'd arg I would argue that uh, every resident of Jefferson County is impacted by this uh, potential uh, movement. Um, I, I also, uh, too much longer than I care to admit, do remember going to my junior high and high school ethics classes and uh, civics classes and recalled something about uh, transparency and free and open government by the people for the people. So I, rec I commend you all for uh, uh, um, considering this petition, uh, which I, I hope you would actually uh, schedule a hearing for. Uh, my son, my 11-year-old son, usually comes, um, but luckily I see some younger, younger folks here, so it's, it's a great example to the kids of the next generation <coughs> about how we can have free and open debate, and so um, I applaud you to, uh, to continue along that course. Thank you very much. Sean Amos and then Regina Hendricks. Good evening, Council. I'm standing before you again thanking you, thanking you so much for putting this on the agenda tonight. 1,500 people in your town ask you to, to look at this sewer bond and to do what they say, to take their opinion and make it your own. Everybody in this town understands that you are their representative. We can't hold CTUG to count. We can't hold your lawyers to count. We can't hold Rothwell to count, but we depend on you guys to be the voice of the people. So thank you so much for putting this on the agenda tonight. We asked for, for weeks, months, for you guys to have this hearing, and now here it is. We would never have filed the lawsuit if we would just have had the hearing. So thank you for at least considering it. I want to take a moment to read something from a Rockwell lawyer, which is not something I would normally do. But I'm going to pass out copies of this to you. And in this, in this particular, where they're asking to be a party to this lawsuit, they say the city's obligations are to the public, not Rockwell. And it is foreseeable that the city could reach an agreement with petitioners that may be in the interest of the general public, but not Rockwell's. I agree. Realize that your council has authorized Rockwell to intervene on Rockwell's behalf. Rockwell admits that it's your job Thank to you, do Ms. something Ray. for the public. Please, please, please have the hearing. Do it for the, the citizens that have asked you to do it. All right, Regina Hendricks and then Cheryl Pullen. Good evening, council members. My name is Regina Hendricks, and I live in Tuscawilla Hills. I'm so happy to see some new faces here. I hope, pray, and believe that you are here to represent the citizens who elected you. And I thank those of you who have stuck with uh, the citizens through this big controversy. This morning, I spent some time reviewing Charlestown's comprehensive plan and I'm impressed with the plans we had for this area. However, we cannot accomplish those goals right now. The animosity over the tricks pulled on us by Project Shuttle and the trickery worked on us by some of our local leaders have produced so much anxiety and anger among the citizens that people are moving away. Our real estate values are plummeting. Our mental health is suffering. The controversy is tearing Jefferson County apart. I love the old bluegrass gospel hymn, Peace in the Valley. However, there will be no peace in our valley until the dirty Danes leave town. Please encourage their departure by accepting our blue petition and holding a public hearing. For God's sake, let us have a say, at least a little say.
is Cheryl Pullen and then Lynn Bocciari. Hello, I'm Cheryl Pullen. Uh, thank you, first of all, for agreeing to consider having the hearing. Uh, I was one of those who petitioned. I know that so often as we would leave the house uh, doorsteps, uh, the resident would say, thank you for doing this and wish us well in getting more signatures in the rest of the day. They wanted Rockwell to pay for their own sewer. It was very important to them. Now it is in your hands. It's time to listen to the desires of the citizens and remind CTUB that you are in control. It is in time to insist that CTUB put the desires of the people over the interest of heavy industry. The people have spoken. Listen and do the right thing. Have a hearing. The citizens are counting on you. Thank you. Lynn, Lynn Bocciari and then Jen Jones. Hi there, Lynn Bocciaro. Uh, thank you for addressing the issue of the blue petition this evening. Many, many hours were spent listening to citizens and collecting these petitions. Over 1,500 people signed the blue petition, and that's just the people who open their door to strangers. They overwhelmingly feel that Rockwell should pay for their own sewer line, even some who are in favor of Rockwell locating here. Please respect the will of the citizens you represent. Rockwell is already being given significant tax breaks and deals. Enough is enough. Thank you. Jen Jones and then Lori Maloney. Thanks for having us tonight. I have three points. First, please hold the hearing. I too petitioned and talked to many of the citizens of Charlestown. And as with my other colleagues here, all of them said, thank you. Please go get more signatures. Walkwell needs to pay for their own sewer. Please hold the hearing. Secondly, please demand that CTUB disclose FOIA requested documents that still have not been received. It's a legal requirement. Third, please do not allow Rockwell to participate in dialogue and debate between citizens and our government. Thank you. Corey Maloney and then Susie Weimer. Hi. Thank you all so much for, for letting us speak tonight, as you have. I know you've given a lot of your time to all these people um, in the community and a lot of thought into this. We are not here tonight to try to debate the pros and cons of the sewer. There is, but I, but I wanna let you know that the new members and, and congratulations on your new post. Um, there's a lot of information that we would love to be able to share with you. There's a lot of legitimate questions that have been raised that we feel have not been adequately answered yet. And now's not the time to discuss all those points. We're really only here tonight to ask one thing, and that's first things first. Just please schedule a hearing, and we can drop the lawsuit. It'll save a lot of time, and it'll save a lot of money. So thank you very much for um, considering that request. Thank you. Weimer. Hi, I'm here on behalf of um, Dr. Christine Weimer this evening. She's unable to be here, and this is a statement that she sent for me to read for you. For weeks, we have begged you to give us a post-vote hearing on the sewer bond ordinance, as we believe the law requires. In absence of you doing so, JCV was forced to file a writ of mandamus asking to ask you to follow the law and give us the hearing. The hearing where a citizens you represent can be heard and our petition can be submitted. Rockwell has now filed to intervene in this lawsuit and it is our understanding that the city has decided to allow this. When was this decided? Who decided it? Why was it not discussed and decided in an open meeting? Did Mr. Funk of the conflicted Steptoe and Johnson decide on this on his own? Did Mr. Hennessy decide without consulting you? The point of the petition is to demonstrate to representatives how the public feels. Though you have been so far successful in evading accepting our petition, you cannot pretend you do not see it or that you don't understand its gravity. 
35% of the voting age population of Charlestown proper signed the blue petition in opposition to the sewer bond, 35% of the population. At this point, it seems the city council wishes to ignore the petition and ignore the will of the people, and now you wish to allow Rockwell to help you ignore the people, and worse yet, yet you decide to do this behind closed doors. How do you ignore 35% of the population? Please hear the will of the people, give the people the hearing, and accept our petition. Thank you. Thank you. Concludes the public comment portion of the meeting. <clears throat> We're going to skip uh, the reports and go into the uh, unfinished business and new business number 3419 and 3405, and basically go into a possible executive uh, session. The blue petition is the first issue, and executive session is permitted by West Virginia Code, section 69A, 4B12. This section of code allows for an executive session when discussing any matter that, by express provision, federal or state statute or rule of court, is rendered confidential. Discuss, discussing matters related to potential litigation would qualify for this exemption. Then the 3405 uh, franchise agreement is uh, under 12, or rather 69A of the open government proceedings, subparagraph 9, to consider matters affecting investment of public funds or other matters involving commercial competition, which if made public might adversely affect the financial or other interests of the state or any political subdivision. Don't ask me to repeat that. <laughs> I make a motion to go into executive session. Uh, I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Uh, uh, just quick discussion. Um, it, just to clarify, do we have any guidance? Can you go, can we make one vote to go into executive session for both of these items? We can, as long as you state the reasons why you've gone in. Okay, so is there any, any opposed to executive session? Okay. Everybody going into executive session. Okay, keep everything calm. Hereby declare that we are out of executive uh, session. We'll move right down to the uh, reports section and we'll do the ward reports. Anything to report Ward 1? No report. No report Ward 1. Ward 2? Ward 2 is more of a question than a report. Did we uh, make any headway on reaching out to the state in regards to 340 and Augustine? So, yeah, I was going to mention it's during the city manager's report, but now's a good time. All right. So, um, so as follow-up to that discussion, Seth uh, Rivard, the city's community development director, uh, reached back out to the city, or I'm sorry, back out to the county, back out to the regional um, transportation authority, the HEPMO, um, and has begun discussions again with them. The real issue he's trying to get at is how do we re um, gain control over some monies that were originally out there to improve the, the four lane uh, or the two lane moving into a four lane all the way down to the Virginia line. So basically what he's trying to do is secure that money for engineering and design work around the intersection itself. So that's what he's trying to accomplish with the, through our regional transportation partner and DOH is a part of those conversations. So, so that's the step we've done so far. Uh, the other thing we're trying to do is get increase or in updated information on any traffic count information. Uh, we do know that they've done some traffic count information on this end of Augustine, but not sure that there's any new data for that end, but we'll try to gather that too. So and the only thing going. The, the only piece I didn't hear was the immediate need for uh, changing the light timing and sequence. Yeah, and that's, that's the conversation with the DOH. I think on that, our strategy was that we were going to try to engage our elected leaders. Uh, uh, well, not, I mean, I'm sorry, our state elected leaders uh, to see if they could help us get an audience with the DOH on that issue. Yeah. Okay. And I'd also <laughs> include uh, 340, 51, 340 uh, with that, if you could. Yeah. Especially with trying to develop the turn lane, getting off at Adam Lee Bridge, as you see in that study, that leads. And, and I will say the improvements that yeah. were made, um, 340 to 340, uh, getting on to 340 in front of um, Keysbury there. Great improvement. Seems like a no-brainer, but the other side. 
Yep, that's where the wrecks are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's one of those projects, the, the, the one you're talking about, the Keys Ferry extension. Um, I mean, that's one of those projects that, again, we work through our regional transportation partner. We get it on the priority list, and that's how those things get funded. So that's why they're an important partner for any improvement that we'll get on 340 and Augustine. Sure. Thank you. Board three. I have been approached by two residents of Ward 3 uh, recently about the speed of traffic entering uh, Charlestown on Washington Street from our east end. Uh, they had already spoken to each other as neighbors and have asked the city, uh, and I advised them that it was a state-owned road, uh, the area that they're talking about. They've asked the city to coordinate with the state to try to get better signage. They feel that the 25 mile an hour uh, speed signs are being lost in the advertising signs for the businesses down there. And they would like to see some a flashing light a, or a uh, one of the signs that'll t flash your speed at you or even the little orange flags to let people know that the speed, that it drops to 25 outside the city limits. And that way it can increase the time that they have to adjust their speed entering our city. Do we still have a couple of those um, speed indicator? We do. I, I think they've outlasted their time. I think they're not working, is my understanding. Uh, they're pretty expensive. Uh, that is, we did have those up, um, but DOH, they just kind of turned a blind eye. That's a state-maintained road through there, um, but something we could look at in the future. But again, there's certainly a cost to we used to have it on George Street. And I think we had two portable ones that we were able to move around. Then we had one we could pull by a vehicle, but they've they've come and gone with their lifespan. They're rusting, and you know, either one of those are operational. Right. Ward four. Oh, I guess welcome I'm back. I, I'm yeah. Ward four now. Okay. Uh, let's see. I attended the Charlestown Utility Board meeting on uh, June 25th, some of the topics, uh, there was a new AT&T lease on the 6th Avenue water tower that was approved. The discussion about pump station alarm system upgrades, apparently some of our pump stations alarms were going through a software update and would have cost a lot of money, so there were discussions on what what we were going to do to move forward with those, which, which alarm companies we were going to use uh, approval of uh, consulting agreements with uh, uh, John Kunkel and Associates, uh, Oil Shingatory, and Steptoe and Johnson is related to the step uh, the Route 9 sewer projects. Approval of sewer user agreements with the Board of Education, Apple Valley Waste, and uh, Dalb. Uh, those were the last, except for one, those are the last sewer user agreements that we had outstanding that were industrial users. Uh, Royal Vendors did not get one because they're in process of shutting down and they didn't feel that they needed to do it and that by the time they would get it approved they would be not using any water anymore. Uh, then there was an approval for a bid for the water treatment plant to clear well. There's an emergency concrete repair. Apparently there was a, a crack in the concrete that was discovered and that they're trying to figure out a way of repairing that without costing uh, a lot of money and without having a lot of downtime for the clear well. Um, what plant is that, Mike? That is at the water treatment plant. Okay. Uh, so they have a plant and they have a, a contractor to get out there to get it fixed and cured and back to operation as soon as possible. Uh, and also they changed the meeting schedule back to the original Wednesday night, so the next meeting will be on the 10th of July at 4 p.m. here. And that's it. So uh, just if I can throw some Ward 4 action in there too. Oh, good. Todd and I uh, went and visited a customer for C-Tub uh, just to kind of the, some of the, the dilemma that they were that they were dealing with, but they're not in the city, they're actually in the county. But you could probably stand and face any direction and throw a stone and hit the city from where they were located. Um, but we also did some follow-up work with C-Tub to kind of figure out what C-Tub's role in that whole thing was. And I think that what really Correct me if I'm wrong, Todd, and please jump in whenever you want, but it seems to me that uh, it really pointed out the lack of zoning enforcement in that area of the county. So, 
where, where, I, where Euclid I was. Euclid Avenue. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's, it was, it was it pretty much of an eye-opener. I don't know if you want to join, add anything into that, Todd, or not. Uh, no, it was just an interesting situation with where, they, where their house is located. And it's in one of those little pockets where there's, you know, city here and over here, and then they're not. And um, there was issues with easements that didn't seem to um, jive with, if they've been in the city, it wouldn't have them, they were, they were built too close to their property. And so we just sort of tried to, they went through a lot of ropes contacting people, trying to figure out what's happened. When they bought the house, they didn't know what was going on. And it's caused them some anxiety. This was on Euclid Avenue? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. But I think for the most part, CTUB did what they were supposed to do. They didn't, they didn't cause the problem. But in fact, somebody, one of the workers came on the weekend and hooked up water to make sure they had water over the weekend. But it really, it was an eye-opener to just basically how the zoning right it, kind of in the middle of our city, which is not in our city, can certainly be <coughs> improved. Yeah. All right. Uh, do we have any committee reports? I don't think so. There's any, uh, on, we're on the committee reports. Uh, for email addresses, I don't know if the new members have got your email addresses set up yet. So, it's so they are. Um, okay, let me... Let me circle back with how you access them. So, okay. I just want to remind you, the Finance Committee will have a meeting tomorrow at 1500. So you're good on that? Okay. All right. City Manager's Report. So just a couple of items. One is I've placed uh, in front of you the West Virginia Municipal League Annual Conference. Um, it's coming up in August. It'll be in Huntington. Um, if I, I've given you the agenda as well. If you're interested in attending, let us know and we will get you registered. and. Um, we have had council members join us in the past. Um, I went last year. I think Todd went as well last year. We had our new judge participate in the event last year. So, again, if there are any council members interested, please let me know and we'll get you connected. And then the other thing, um, I think most of you know, we'll be having, there's a community meeting tomorrow night, Jefferson County Community Ministries, uh, the business community, um, the city, other representatives will be there over at CW Hall. If you're able to join us, please do so. We're going to talk about, um, you know, the challenges that our downtown's facing and the needs of, uh, of the population served by JCCM, uh, just to make sure we're, you know, where we, where we need to be as a community. So uh, 5 o'clock, the uh, CW Hall. Chief. Okay. Um, circle back to your uh, information. Uh, last uh, council meeting, uh, typically once a month, I'll give you a breakdown of activity, uh, what the department is seeing, what it's caused to service, traffic stops, uh, things like that. So a lot of that information is really good for you to, to give out to the community. Um, certainly I will. It, it, you can tell them to communicate with me. Um, you know, it's a constant problem in the town. The town is growing. There's a lot of people coming through this. It's a major route through Jefferson County. Um, you know, we're working hard to try to curb that. For a small agency, we're working close to 400 crashes a year. That's a lot. Um, 16 men and women that do that, uh, tractor trailer wreck will be about 30 pages by the time it gets done, and that'll take pretty much a shift to want to investigate it and do it. But, you know, certainly we can talk a little more of, of what we can do. And we, you know, I often get complaints from residents, and I spoke to one on George Street Extended today, um, try to work through, try to get, get our officers in the area to kind of saturate it. That's where you'll see the directed patrols. A lot of those are in developments on a street, uh, trying to be visible and try to slow folks down. But um, I welcome you guys. Uh, you know, certainly my office is now on, down at 661. Please come down, uh, meet the staff, uh, you know, and anything that you guys might need, let me know, okay? Uh, I often try to uh, highlight some good police work uh, that I think is good police work. In fact, last year, Bank of Charlestown was robbed. Uh, we investigated that, did a great job. Uh, that subject was recently uh, sentenced in U.S. Di District Court in Martinsburg to 20 years incarceration. Uh, you want to commend uh, Detective Meeks for her hard work. Um, so that's all I've got tonight. 
Thanks, Chief. Thank you. Uh, Chief, I have a question. Did Sorry. you guys get your air conditioning fixed yet? Working on it. It's still a little humid, humid in there, but uh, it's going to take some time, I guess. Okay. Okay, let's move on to unfinished business, uh, item number 3419, which is the uh, response to the blue petition litigation that was filed uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, I make a motion that we employ the law firm of Steptoe and Johnson to file a response of pleading to the petition filed against the city of Charlestown by Jefferson County Vision, Inc. and three individuals. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any any discussion? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Okay, down to the next item is the... Did you want to kind of address the issue of the... Oh, issue? thank you very much, yes. <clears throat> I just wanted to set the record straight um, as far as the um, in intervention from Rockwell. Neither the city or the city's attorneys authorized Rockwell to intervene in the writ of mandamus and lawsuit, nor did the city or city attorneys object for said intervention as Rockwell is a necessary party to the litigation. Also, Rockwell does not require the city's authorization to intervene. That's just to clear the record on that issue. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, second reading and consideration of an ordinance authorizing the engagement of the law firm Steptoe and Johnson, PLC, a special municipal council, to represent the city of Charlestown. I need a motion to open up the public hearing. I would so move. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 The ayes have it. All right, so we don't have anyone signed up for public hearing? On this ordinance. Okay. The public hearing is for the uh, second reading and consideration of an ordinance authorizing the engagement of the law firm Septo and Johnson, PLLC, a special municipal council to represent the city of Charlestown. To kind of, I guess, circle back from the ordinance committee and explain what this agenda item is about. This is the second reading. Our first reading was at the last city council meeting. Um, the city council has already engaged Steptoe and Johnson as our legal counsel. Um, however, the West Virginia Code has a section in it for the type of relationship that we have with Steptoe and Johnson where we're not having just a dedicated city attorney for the city of Charlestown. We have an entire firm that will basically deliver to us different people that have different experience and different aspects, whether we're dealing with you know, a bond issue or a civil issue or some sort of liability issue. Um, and so with that, there are also some language in there about conflicts of interest, um, basically protecting the city. The Ordinance Committee tried uh, as hard as we could to protect the city from uh, any unknown possible uh, conflicts of interest that could arise on anything that's presented to us that our legal counsel works on. That, um, and, and they have certainly been made aware in those Ordinance Committee meetings that it is extremely prudent uh, to err on the side of caution whenever even the perception of a conflict of interest might arise. Um, so once again, the, the city has already authorized the, the engagement of Steptoe and Johnson. This is simply making an ordinance um, to kind of put that on paper and to put in those protections for the city in case of conflict of interest. Yeah. So I'll make a motion, or actually, I'm sorry, we're in the public hearing. I was gonna say we're still in the public hearing, so we'll need to close the public hearing. I'll make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Do we want to see if anybody wants we to speak? We on didn't the topic? have anyone signed up. Does, does anyone want to speak to the? Second reading consolidation. We did. We, we reference that, but again, this is not time sensitive. I mean, in the interest of. Um, yeah, um, we could do it at the. Yeah, at the next we could keep this, this on the table. That and has we'll, to pass this evening. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm all right. That's perfectly fine. Thank you. So, so we need a motion to table. Well, we need a motion to close the public hearing first. <laughs> well, well. 
Why don't, no, why don't, why we, don't could, we table? I think we could yeah. table during. You could yeah. table in a public hearing. That way, it'll open. We'll have. We'll we'll take the public hearing off the table. Because technically, it's the next still meeting. open, so people can yep. submit in okay. writing or. Okay. Right. So then, I'll make a motion to table until the next meeting. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. The item is tabled. So let's go down to uh, item number thirty-four and nine. That is a public hearing. Second reading and consideration of amendments to the codified code to the city of Charleston, West Virginia, with regard to part 13, planning and zoning code, article 1322, zoning and district provisions, article 1323, supplemental regulations, and article 1333, site planning and design specifications. Do we have a motion to, now, I, I gotta tell you right off the bat, if Seth is not here, if there's any questions, so. Just, Right, the thought what we would do is open the public hearing if we receive some comments that we can't answer, you know, then we could keep this on the table for consideration at the next meeting. Um, but if there are no public comments, then maybe council will be ready to act on this one. And just to give a brief on this for anybody that missed the last reading of this, um, these are changes that Seth worked with uh, hand in hand with the Planning Commission. Uh, they spent a lot of time on this. Nothing in this jumped out to the Ordinance Committee as um, not aligning with our goals or, or changing anything radically or anything like that. Um, our biggest concern was that nothing in these proposed changes was in conflict with any of our current ordinances that we have in place or with West Virginia State Code. Um, we had Stepto and Johnson go over that. Uh, they identified about a dozen things that they thought maybe possibly, you know, uh, could, you know, could be in conflict, but we went through every single one of them and we all agreed unanimously, you know, great that he brought all those to us out of an abundance of caution, but none of it really does. So I support this. So do we have a motion to open up the public hearing? Aye. We have a motion to second, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the public hearing is hereby open. All right, we didn't have anyone sign up for public hearing on this item. Okay. There's two, usually there are two sign up. There's usually right. multiple sheets on the on the dais. I mean, certainly we could allow somebody to speak yeah, on so it. Anyone can step yeah, up I'd and talk if they want to. If somebody wants to speak to the to this issue, to this particular issue, 3409, <laughs> in a public hearing. The issue is a uh, second reading consideration of amendments to the codified codes of the city of Charleston, West Virginia with regard to part 13 planning and zoning code. Article 1322, Zoning District Provisions. Article 1323, Supplemental Regulations. And Article 1333, Site Planning and Design Specifications. So essentially, the, you know, the layman version of that is these are commercial design standards. So for any building that uh, would be built in the city of Charlestown, it basically tries to define the standard that we would want. At the moment, we don't have any kind of a standard. We don't have a clear standard in our zoning or subdivision uh, ordinances and this attempts to do that. Again, it went through the Planning Commission. Uh, the Planning Commission did hold its own public hearing on this as well. Um, and they've recommended these uh, changes to the council. Okay. Since we have no- I move to close the public hearing. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Uh, public aye. hearing is hereby closed. We need a motion to approve the second reading and consideration of those amendments. I'll make a motion to approve the second reading and consideration of amendments. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Okay. So let's kind of shift some things around. Um, let's go to new business and I just I want to get some folks through here. Uh, let's do the request by St. James Catholic Church to permit fireworks display per ordinance section 545, 10 Charlie of the Charlestown <coughs> Codified Code of Ordinances. Essentially, as, as uh, those of us who are here when this, uh, let me get the. Uh, <coughs> 545. Yeah, 545. If you can get, kind of go over 545 if you have it there. We voted to, uh, there we go. So 
on page 46 in the packet. Right. Page 46. Essentially to revise our fireworks ordinance based on the, the uh, reflections of the state law last year. The bottom line is if you go to... Uh, so it's the, this one's on the top of page 47. So basically... Section C. Yeah, Subsection C. C where it, talk, where it says um, exemptions because you're not allowed to light off fireworks. Exemption request of subsection B shall be submitted in writing to the city council. The city council will render its decision after appropriate consultation with the fire and police chiefs. So, did you, you were able to include that in the Oh, package? I did. Um, sorry, but I do have copies of that. All right, so what you have in your packet is um, uh, you have the, the request from the applicant. Um, and as a special activity permit, um, not necessarily sure we needed that because it doesn't look like it requires any city resources. That said, uh, it's my understanding that the applicant has had a chance to speak with the chief um, and, uh, and the fire chief as well to see if there are any concerns. Uh, what we're handing out to you now is uh, uh, questions and answers from the state fire marshal. So they're suggesting that they follow this, basically this best practice uh, with a couple of additions. One is they'd set them off no closer than 300 feet to any structure uh, and that they would provide notice to the um, uh, to the nearby neighborhood. Right. And I don't think we're talking about commercial. I think they're more of a not professional. I don't know what that's. It's consumer been. fireworks. Yeah. Is what they're under 50 or whatever the 50 grand. It's on the 4th of July. That's right. The they're under the whatever the 50 grand. Go from 9 to 10 is essentially. Uh, did we get any comment from the uh, fire company? We did. We, we, I, we talked to uh, chief, uh, the fire chief and uh, police chief here, and basically they, they, they had no problem with it as long as the applicant followed these recommendations from the fire marshal. So again, typically with some of these special activities permits, the, the staff takes care of these, but this specifically in the ordinance said it was up to the city council, so that's why it's before us today. So although I don't particularly uh, feel like re-engaging the fireworks conversation from <laughs> last year, um, I, I guess my only concern would be <clears throat> moving forward, I mean, obviously, I, I don't see a date on here that they would. Yeah, they don't see a date or Fourth time. of July. It, the date it's is the 4th of this July. Yeah. Okay. Um, so obviously, if we don't make a decision tonight, they're not going to be able to have their fireworks. Um, and, and so I'm inclined to not, you know, prohibit them from doing that, especially if they've already made plans, if they've already invited their congregation or sent out advertisements or anything like that. Um, at the same time, this probably should have then been submitted a little earlier than, than it was. Um, but I guess if, if you took off, you know, who this organization was, I don't know if I would be. I'm, I'm a little more inclined because it's, you know, it's a nonprofit, it's a religious organization, it's a church. Um, but at the same point, they're, they're not having professional fireworks. And so it's not much different than me you know, crossing the line into Pennsylvania and, and getting my own fireworks and lighting them off as long as I'm staying 300 feet away from another building. And, and so I guess how moving forward are we going to, are we going to deal with that? It's a good point. And I think uh, basically we had the exemption clause in the ordinance to, and you wouldn't have to go to Pennsylvania to get your fireworks. But, you get your fireworks right here. And, you know, I could throw a stone and set off fireworks. Great. Right. So the question is, how do we handle exemptions? Since we did, there is a clause for exemptions in there. How do, how do we handle it? With this, is this the process to do it? And we're even for a permanent, uh, a private citizen. I'm sorry. I mean, we're using our best judgment here. I mean, we went to the fire marshal's website, looking at what they had to provide. There's no guidance in the ordinance. Again, I don't want to have to hash that out again, <laughs> but uh, right. um, we're intimately you know, my one concern I do have is where does it stop? You know, um, you know, this is ideal because it's in a field, it's away from a structure um, where you may get into a smaller development like, uh, or a bigger, closer compact like Huntfield, Norborn Glebe, downtown Charlestown, you know, your, your risks go up a little bit more. So, I mean, certainly I think it's a case by case uh, and you have to look at some of that. Fireworks are fun. 
I mean, th those are kind of my concerns. I mean, I, like I said, I, th I think we definitely need to figure out something moving forward. This needs to be revisited, and ordinance committee can certainly take a look if we need to. Um, but you know, there there has to be some sort of process here, a requirement from the city. You know, if if we're obliged to say, yeah, if if the police and fire chiefs think it's a suitable location, and just the sheer fact that we know it's taking place here at a certain time by way of the special event permit, if, if that's enough for the city council, then, then so be it. But then that should kind of be applied moving forward. Um, you know, if it's just private citizen wants to do it for a wedding, I don't know, would we? I, I'm not sure. Well, according um, to this, uh, again, according to our ordinance, it's really nothing. It come before us and it would, whoever w it was would have to jump through the hoops with the fire chief and the police chief and then come before the city council and be like, right now it's on a case by case basis. And if you look at this, and I know that you have, it, it kind of looks very similar to our ordinance, Agreed. or the ordinance that was drafted, I should say, or, you know, earlier last year. So I don't know if, if there's going to be an exemption in our ordinance. That's a good point. How do we how do we handle? It? Well, my unpreparedness. I don't want that to be the cause of you know this church not being able to perform their fireworks celebration for the Fourth of July. So. Reluctantly, I'll make a motion to approve this special event permit, um, and then I'll work with Daryl on getting this on the ordinance agenda so that we can discuss maybe how we can clean this up. Okay. Agree with Daryl. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. I got a paper well, they are fine. Right. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, appointments to boards and commissions and discussion of the tree board. Give some background on that, Daryl. All right, so um, just want to, a couple of items are left over from our last uh, council meeting. So we have made all of the appointments to the standing committees, so that's done. Um, so what now has to happen, we do have a vacancy on the planning commission that we will fill with a council member. I have had at least one member express an interest to me. So if you're another council member interested in filling that seat, let me know and then I'll, I'll work with, uh, with the chairman and we'll figure out a way to get that back in front of the group. If it ends up just being the one council member, then maybe by you know, um, default, this person becomes our planning commission representative. Uh, the Board of Zoning Appeals, we had talked about this last time, we now have a vacancy on the Board of Zoning Appeals. Uh, my, it's my intention to post that vacancy um, later this week and begin the process of filling that. Uh, that requires somebody who's lived in the city at least three years, so there's a higher standard for the BZA. Um, and then the other one, and this one I needed just a little bit of feedback from Council on, and that is we now have a vacancy on the uh, the Board of Park and uh, Recreation. Nick Zaglifa was serving as a council representative to that board. Um, the way that the language reads, it basically says up to two members of council can serve, may, may serve on the board. We do have one current member, uh, <coughs> Councilman Coyle is on that. Um, it doesn't require two. Um, we could open up that other position to a public citizen if we wanted to. Uh, I know council, former Councilman Zaglifa has expressed an interest in maybe staying on the, the board, um, but I guess I'm trying to get a sense, do we, would we like to fill that with a council position or with a council member? Uh, are you open to the notion that we advertise it more broadly to see what kind of interest there might be in serving I, on the board? I mean, unless somebody has a burning desire to do parks and rec, I think a public citizen would be a, a fine choice. Well, I, I have had one council member who expressed some oh. interest in being a part, member of the the parks well, he board. does do he does a lot of park work. He, so. he does a lot of work on the Thank parks you. board. Thank you very much. So, um, so I guess the point it's a little bit vague about whether or not that has to be a council member. It has been a council member historically. So, if uh, and we have at least had one council member express an interest. I don't know if you're really that interested, or you just were joking. But I mean, if you're serious, then then maybe that's the way we go about filling that vacancy. I would kind of recommend we consider because of the way the language is that we open it up, but it would not preclude a council member from filling that position. Yeah. So that way we would do basically the way we would. Yep. Announce the vacancy with the, and yeah, get some names. Comply okay. with the language in there. Okay. 
I can do that. I will do that. And then the, the final thing we wanted to talk about tonight then is the tree board. And we had talked about this with the council maybe uh, a month or so ago. And there was a little bit of concern about the ordinance and the way that it reads. Um, but you had asked if we could maybe go back and, and get a little bit better perspective on maybe what some other communities are doing with tree boards and the value of a tree board. So with that, I think Jeff, Mac, Jeff, right? Tanner? Sam. 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 Why do I have Jeff? Can you tell Who's me Jeff? Jeff? <laughs> Sam Adams. Sam Adams. Yes. Sam oh, no, no, no. That's, 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 that's yeah. sorry. That, I'm sorry. That's, that's his, that's his representative. Sorry about that. That's fine. That's um, fine. He puts out fires. That Jeff. <laughs> I can, uh, I can speak a little bit to, uh, the value of a tree board. Um, tree boards. Oh, just Sam, who are you with? And uh, the division of forestry. I am the urban forester statewide. So I would be working directly with this tree board, um, as kind of a liaison for the division of forestry. <coughs> Um, where was I? So they would be your liaison for any kind of city tree or any kind of tree on a city right of way, any publicly owned tree. Um, basically it's combined, uh, or comprised of volunteer members who are well versed in public tree care, or at least have an interest in public tree care. Uh, normally they're knowledgeable in tree biology, uh, tree maintenance, tree risk assessment, urban forestry inventories and are involved in local government such as a councilor or city planner. I'm not exactly sure how your ordinances are written, so you might require a council member or someone from public works. I know Shepherdstown does that. Um, uh, tree boards are responsible for writing and upholding to the best of their abilities uh, sea tree or city tree ordinances concerning public trees. They take urban forestry inventories of publicly owned trees and normally maintain a database um, of all the trees on right of way, streetscapes, etc. Because they have current inventories, they can then help prioritize maintenance and removal based on the need and health of each individual tree. So you will end up saving money in the long run because of that. Um, tree boards try to foster tree diversity and reduce tree risk and pest infestation and disease. They ensure that trees are planted in the correct site by working with public and private uh, utilities to reduce conflict with overhead or underground utilities. Tree boards actively work to beautify city and foster community volunteerism while doing so. Uh, most tree boards increase canopy coverage um, of the ur urban forest to maximize the benefits they provide, so like increase shade and cooler sidewalks, um, reduce stormwater runoff, increased carbon sequestration, stuff like that. And it's really advantageous to you as a community to have a tree board um, because they're educated or at least enthusiastic about tree care. They don't necessarily have to know everything about trees, just gung-ho about doing something. Make sure that your investment and public trees are properly cared for and maintained to maximize the benefits that they currently provide. Uh, tree boards help reduce liabilities by being proactive in the removal and maintenance of trees. Uh, let's see. Because you're being proactive with tree maintenance and keeping current inventories, you'll probably end up saving up to 20% on your tree maintenance costs over a certain period of decades. And it does take a while to get to a maximized benefit, but you do get there. Uh, main, the main benefit is they volunteer for you, they're for the city council, and they're for Charlestown as a whole. So it's a way to get your community involved, you know. Um, also, the biggest thing, at, with the Division of Forestry, we offer one grant specifically to communities that have active tree boards and are on their way or make it to Tree City USA status. It's called the Demonstration City Grant and it's up to $10,000, which is a 50-50 matching grant um, for anything related to tree pruning, tree removals, tree inventories, which normally the 10,000 <coughs> is for tree inventories uh, because it's just so expensive on the upfront end. Um, but yeah, that, is, that would be available to your city if you 
you know, restart your tree board. And I do have some, a couple successful tree board stories uh, in 2016, 2017. I'll try to limit this a little bit because I know it's getting late. Um, 2016, 2017, Lewisburg got hit with emerald ash borer beetle and it took out 50 white and green ash trees on city owned property. We were able to fund them to reduce uh, the ones that were hazardous at that time. They, re they removed 20 trees, we funded most of that work. Um, Summersville over the last decade has planted approximately 300 trees in Summersville parks and along Route 19 using Demonstration City grant funding. Uh, last year, Morgantown completed a whole city uh, inventory by Planet Geo using Demonstration City grant funding. Um, my final remark is having a dedicated tree board will save you money in the long term, especially whenever you couple it with the grants that we offer. They'll take the role of stewards for your public trees and work to reduce reliab or liabilities caused by public trees. And they'll work to mitigate tree and pest diseases. And they'll work to beautify Charlestown and increase community outreach and involvement doing so. That's about all I have for you. Uh, right. If there are any questions, I would feel free to ask. So, so where we left this last time is, again, that um, we've, we have an inactive tree board. We've had an inactive tree board for several years here in right. Charlestown. Uh, we've got an ordinance that we think might be a little outdated uh, given where we are today. Uh, there was some thought about maybe a tree board helps us um, with some recommendations to change the ordinance in addition to all the other things that were referenced there. Um, and it's one of the comprehensive plans, a goal in our comprehensive plan to reestablish the tree, the tree board. So, so that was the reason why the staff had brought that back. Okay. Um, if, as, as I was talking to, to uh, uh, President Pro, or Mayor Pro Tem, wow. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking to the presiding chair, or presiding officer um, about that earlier today. I mean, maybe a step short of, of activating the tree board, maybe we could, you could direct staff to begin to work with Mr. Adams and some interested um, citizens to maybe identify what we might want to do with our ordinance so that we yeah. so that we're not creating a tree board that has an ordinance maybe that's out of step with where council wants to be um, you know maybe we could start to do that so that there's something to present to council before you start adding or appointing people to the tree board and it wouldn't necessarily then throw the ordinance over to the ordinance committee and then try to sort through the issue themselves so I mean, maybe that's a way for us to, again, kickstart this process without necessarily doing the appointments yet as maybe the, an alternative. So, should, but we should think there are lots of benefits to that having we a tree. We were a, a Tree City USA at yes. one point, and it still says that on the signs when you come in, it is, to, you know, welcome to Tree City yeah, USA. I, so, you know. And I believe we did, did get a grant. Yeah, yeah, we did. I don't think that ever really goes away. I think once you're a tree city, you're always a tree city. It's just the number of years doesn't go up. Yeah. You know? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we have a sign. So it be. <laughs> <laughs> but we have, uh, the Division of Forestry has several really good example of tree ordinances. One that we always point to is Marietta, Ohio. They're mm -hmm. nearly the gold standard of like small town tree ordinances, smaller town. Um, yeah. Uh, Morgantowns are very good. We can probably pro provide co copies for that. I, mean, I, th I think the, the biggest thing for this, I don't think anybody's going to be opposed to a tree board or the work that they would do. I think the biggest thing is participation. I mean, have we identified, I mean, do we have enough public participation, volunteerism to create? Yeah, we do. Yeah. 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 Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. I mean, then I'm all for it. I mean, if, if we have the, the people. I've had a lot of trees here. And I've had a lot of people. as well. Yeah. We have experience and talent that are interested yeah. in serving. Yeah. And I think uh, the, the thought that what was Daryl was talking to earlier is we can kind of get a scope of what we want the tree board to do because there has, I mean, there's going to be a financial piece to it as well. <coughs> it would be nice to have the whole package before we actually constitute the tree board. It just right. kind of I think initially it's just getting our inventory and what we have and, mm -hmm. and the financial part of it is further down the road that is that's, I mean, that's should be a consideration but progress with later on I mean once you get volunteers who can you know identify trees you could start making an inventory that way or wait uh, a couple years and we might be able to fund one 
Well, we already have an intern that's doing that with right. a bunch oh, of volunteers. Oh, yeah, that's right. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We do. We have a, an intern this summer who's out inventorying the trees right now. Mm -hmm. And we can task the tree board with some of that responsibility. I don't know that we have to do their work for them before they get started. Right. Well, and that's the way we originally had pitched it, actually, is that you'd have a tree board, and one of the things they would be doing is, is starting to sort through the, the ordinance itself and what have you. But it, but the prior council suggested that we slow down just a little bit on that because I think the ordinance is pretty dated here. So, could, could we have the folks that you know that, that you guys talk to about this? I mean, maybe we could have an, like an open house, a meeting of some sort, or even just like a. I don't know, like a couple page document. Hey, here's the plan as to how we get from where we're currently at to a functioning tree board. And here would kind of be the idea and request for financials. And here would be, you know, kind of a meeting schedule and when we would start uh, advertising for the spots on the board and just kind of a bit of a packet to kind of show us, hey, how do we get from where we're at to actually functioning? Okay. I work with you guys on it. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, so I'll, I'll work with um, with Seth and then others uh, who have expressed an interest in this and put together that plan. That would be cool with that course of action. Absolutely. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Okay. The one we've all been waiting for. County parking lot negotiations. No, actually, let's let's go to the uh, blue petition response. Okay. Yeah, blue petition response. Item number thirty-four twenty-one. All right. So just to get this conversation started, um, so at our previous meeting we had talked about. Well, actually, we had a motion to uh, to place this item on the agenda. Um, the community has asked us uh, several times to consider uh, accepting the blue petition, whatever accepting may mean. Um, so I think what we wanted to do is at least get the conversation started. Technically, we have received the petition. It is in the city's hands at the moment. Um, but, you know, obviously the city hasn't, um, this is, well, we haven't acted on it in any particular way um, other than to address the legal challenge that we've talked a little bit about at this point. So I think what we wanted is to begin a conversation with counselors about, um, you know, what do we want to do about this petition? How do we want to, um, how do we want to respond to it? Um, are there, are there actions that we could be taking outside of the legal actions that we've talked about? Yeah, I mean, I think I like this being on the agenda. I, you know, asked for it to be on here. I, I certainly support discussing this. I think, um, that the people that petitioned and the people that signed deserve at least some sort of response from us about what we think about uh, their efforts and, and what the petition asked for. Um, this conversation and the legal conversation are two completely different uh, conversations. Um, I support the city's path with the current legal situation. Um, but I do think that I certainly don't I'm not opposed to the idea of revisiting the bond vote. Um, I'm not opposed to the idea of revisiting that conversation. Uh, we do have three new city council members that, unless they were very, very closely paying attention, are just simply not as informed as the rest of us that sat through, you know, an hour of public comment every night for the last, what? Eight months. <laughs> eight or, eight or ten year, months. Um, and all of the information that we gleaned from CTUB, from Rockwell, from, um, our attorneys and so obviously I voted you know against the sewer bond so yeah of course I would like to uh, revisit that but at the same point I also believe that the situation has changed and so my vote's not an automatic um, because it's a different vote than it was uh, back then uh, I certainly have some questions I'll allow everybody else to kind of talk first when I and then I'll get to kind of some of the updated questions that I have um, but those are my initial thoughts on it Uh, I appreciate that, and I'm one of the new city councilmen, and I, I don't know much about the whole process other than what I've heard from, uh, from the public comment. And uh, I think being a lawyer, uh, and I see that this issue's in litigation, uh, 
it would seem to me that we might want to get some direction from the court as to what we have to do. Uh, and I think you, you divide that into two very different things, what we have to do and what we want to do. And so I think we need to wait till the court tells us what we have to do uh, before we can make a decision as to what we want to do. Uh, so if we have to do something, then we'll go ahead and do that as directed by the court. So I would think that it might make some sense to table this, uh, the discussion on, on doing something about the boot petition till we get for a little bit further along in the litigation. Uh, I would assume that the litigation will proceed in a normal fashion and there will be motions filed and the judge will be making interim rulings. Uh, and so if, if, the, if the judge says we've got to do it, then we'll do that. If the judge says we don't have to do it, then we'll take what my esteemed colleague has said and, and we'll have a candid discussion as to whether we want to do it or not. I guess, I mean, certainly my preference would be to discuss it now. Um, I kind of like the idea of being able to decide what we want to do and not be told by the courts. I mean, at the end of the day, if, if we decide to make, if we decide to do something that appeases the, the ones that are asking this of us, then the, kind of what the court says is moot, right? Um, but, I mean, I, I certainly understand that viewpoint. that just to reiterate on that point if uh, if the court's ruling is that we have to that we're required to do it and if, if, if we had the discussion beforehand let's say the the intention of the council the vote of the council was not to do anything then we'd have to revisit it once we were basically directed by the court to do it so I think in uh, councilman Cradleville's point is that once the court has decided one way or the other I think we have a little bit more freedom on how we want to respond to the petition. Well, certainly once a, once a motion to table has been made, there's no more discussion. So I I'll don't ask, think we don't have a motion. There is no motion. We don't. And so I wanted to ask just a couple quick questions just before um, anybody does. Some of the things that would be important to me, let me get back to kind of my notes from public comment. Um, what would the cost to date? What, what is the cost to date right now that the city has taken on from this project? How has it changed since we made that vote? Um, have we transferred the line of credit yet from Ransom to the city of Charlestown, or are they still in possession of that? What is the likelihood of the state reimbursing us for those costs? I've, I've had a conversation uh, with the assistant utility utility manager where she told me that she had been assured by the state that. They weren't going to, quote, leave us, you know, holding the bag on this one. How can we get verification of that? How does that currently stand? Um, is there a possibility to do a referendum on this issue? Uh, what, what's the legality of that? Can we call for a referendum? And how much would that cost? Um, obviously, the, the people here have put their voice down on paper. Uh, that paper, unfortunately, doesn't mean too much, uh, at least not nearly as much as a binding vote or even a non-binding vote. Um, but could we do a referendum and how much would that cost? Um, my last question, I had reached out to the assistant utility manager and, and re-asked a question that I had asked of her in Rockwell back in January, which was to see their plumbing schematics. Uh, they put it off at the time, but we are well past the date where they said that it would be complete. Um, she said she would get those for me. Uh, additionally, I'd like to make a new request that uh, Rockwell provide us with their last six months of water and sewer usage down in Bihalia. Um the last time we did that, we saw some extremely abnormal things from their uh, water and sewer bills uh, that they put in writing were admittedly 500% higher than what they told us we would be receiving here uh, at supposedly an identical plant. Um, they seem to have issue with their own water and sewer bills, and so I think it's reasonable now that we're uh, about six months after that fact to ask them again, okay, well, what was the resolution that you had down there, and can we see the last six months? Has it been fixed for you? I think those are reasonable questions that at least update us on some of the, the items out there. Yeah, so let me, I, I did follow up on that question of the cost to date, because you had asked this question, I think, at the last meeting. And um, 
so after conversation with the utility board staff, you know, I get the impression that it's about a million three to a million five, you know, in terms of total cost here, design plus some additional costs that have happened since the, uh, the ransom design efforts. Does, does that include that line of credit? Yes. Okay, yeah, so we were at a little over a million, now we're at like one three to one five. One three to one five, somewhere in that neighborhood. So just to give you a sense of what the, you know, that risk is starting to look like. Um, and that's order of magnitude. The other thing I would say is that I did at one time try to get, I did ask Rockwell if they wanted to update their, um, the water and sewer numbers from the Mississippi plant. Now it's been several months since I asked them that. Uh, I didn't get any response back from them. So uh, there has at least been one attempt to try to get them to clarify the data, but maybe we could try again. It wouldn't hurt to ask them again. I mean, give them another opportunity at least. Mm -hmm. I think an important point to the money though is, is the line of credit still open? Because that means we're still paying, I guess it has to be because it has been paid off. Yeah. Right, and I don't think it's been transferred, but I'll need to confirm that. Um, I, I didn't understand the third one, the likelihood of the state reimbursing us. I just wanna make sure so, I. So I had asked Kristen Stolifer, you know, what, say this didn't transfer over, you know, would they just leave Ransom holding the bag on that line of credit with, with the state? Say we didn't approve the you know, bond, okay. uh, the sewer bond initially, would they have just left Ransom? And now that it's being kind of transferred to us, you know, what if, I think I posed the scenario that what if one of their permits doesn't get completed or blah, blah, or they can't build for whatever reason, um, would we be reimbursed for that line of credit if they couldn't build? Right. Um, and so where does that currently stand? The, it seemed like she had an idea that the state had already discussed that and said, yes, we're not gonna leave you hanging. Well, that certainly takes a lot of the risk out if that's true. Yeah, okay, I got it, thank you. Do you mean not leave us hanging if the bond didn't go through? Yeah, yeah, if the bond didn't go through and Rock, say, say Rockwell had to finance this thing on their own through 5-5, right? And we didn't approve the bond. Well, initially the state was gonna spend what, $10 million to build this and so if they, are only spending one and a half, but Rockwell's paying for the rest. Do they really care? They saved eight and a half. You see what I'm saying? I do, but I, this is the first I've heard that they said that there was any. I think it was an informal discussion and just basically saying, look, yeah, if something catastrophic were to happen and this didn't go through, or one of the, I think the example I used to Kristen was one of the uh, pieces of litigation that are taking place. If one of them was supremely successful and Rockwell couldn't build, what then happens to that line of credit that's owed upon? Um, and she seemed to have some informal assurance from the state that they would take care of it. Well, that, that would be uh, well worth clarification because it was always my understanding was that if we voted down the bond and, and went uh, nine, that the route where Rockwell built or built it or you know did whatever percentage of the building it, that that we would still be liable for that one million dollars. So that that's interesting. I had not heard that they had informally said well like i said i think it was very low level informal you know just kind of a hey what if but certainly it would be nice to get clarification if it's right. if that's an actual now, if it was out of out of our control i can see possibly that but so that would be okay. yeah definitely clarify that i just wanted to to just to make a, an observation from my personal perspective we hear you so it's not like we don't hear all the people that signed that petition, we do hear you. So I know that comes up time and time again, we hear you. So I just want you to know that. We're not just deaf here. We hear what you're saying. So I don't know how the other, uh, I'm sure the other council members probably feel the same way. So don't be worried that you're not being heard. Stan, thank you. Would you mind if I respond to that? Uh, I guess my concern is, is with the public hearing idea, that I don't think that you're going to get the result out of having that public hearing that, that you think that there is. I, I think the idea is that if we have a public hearing, it then opens up this new 
this new time frame where you could put this petition down and it has, I guess, more legality or, or some sort of more binding position. Um, I guess in, in my mind, the public hearings that we have are, are to hear the residents. We hear you guys every single city council meeting, and we listen. I, I, th I think you know I listen. Um, but I, I, I guess just simply having a public hearing, I, I don't know how that's going to be too much different than the same information. Not, not that we don't get new information, but it's not going to be much different than the public comment section that we have. I mean, there's still going to be a, a time frame on it. As many people as, as want to sign up can. I mean, it's going to be identical to, to all of our public comment unless there was an idea that that somehow legally binds us to then accept the petition that was presented on that night, which I, I just don't believe to be the law. Um, and, and certainly there is some truth to the, the fact that there is a law that says the four-fifths majority, but that specific statute is very clear that the time for that specific statute and that specific petition was like August 6, 2018, what was, was the first public hearing that we had on this last year. And so <coughs> I, I have no problem revisiting the bond vote. I have no problem having a, pu a public hearing, but I, I don't see how that's much different than just having public comment. So yeah, Amos, could, you, could you come up to the microphone yeah. so yeah we can. and then we're going to kind of cut this short because this is really not the time for a public comment we we believe we believe that in order for us to truly present the petitions the way the law envisions it is important for that hearing to be had the fact that we have actually just given you physically given you the petitions in our mind does not make them officially presented they must be officially presented at a hearing we would not be suing for that hearing if we thought it was just going to be another set of public comment. We believe at that point the petitions will be presented in a legal way. We do not believe that just handing them to you was, was how it was meant to be done. So I understand what you're saying as well, and I know that, that, that what you guys are being told by your legal counsel is not what we're being told by ours. And perhaps it just has to go to a judge <laughs> or, you know, through the courts for that to happen. We would rather not have that happen, Mr. Crowderville. We don't want to sue the city of Charlestown. We don't want to spend the time and the money to do any of that. So we're just asking you to have a public hearing at which the petitions could actually be presented in a legal manner, not just handing them to your city manager. Okay, we, we got it. I appreciate it. One of Mike's questions uh, remains unaddressed, the can we call a referendum? And I actually thought that had been addressed, so if you bring it up again, I missed something. Yeah, so please sure. clarify on my behalf. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, I will need to research that a little bit. I mean, in all reality, I mean, that's the best way, right, to validate the petition is, you know, cause certainly people have their questions as to how many people signed. I don't. I think it's an overwhelming uh, majority of people that would have signed. Um, had they known about it, I think it's tough to petition. I, I know what goes through my head when somebody knocks on my door. It's the last person I feel like talking to, um, no matter who they are. Um, but I think, you know, a referendum, hey, there's your end-all, be-all answer. Here's how the community feels about it. Here are yeah. the ones that are rejuvenated enough to come out and vote. Here are the ones that, that aren't. But there's an official tally. And I would say, unfortunately, I don't think we have a provision of that in our charter. But we do kind of have a referendum, and that's the, we just had elections in May. Yeah, we, we definitely don't have referendum language in our charter, in our ordinances, anywhere there. Uh, because when the, when the second petition was being circulated, my initial thought was it was a referendum petition. Um, and so I started to think, well, I, I've got to go look at the state laws. Does state law allow for referendums? And I couldn't get a clear answer on that. So I need to, I'll need to do some more research on that. Once, I mean, once we found out it wasn't a referendum petition, I mean, then it kind of took a different path. So that's definitely worth us doing some more research on. And if we did, I think to the councilman's um, point is that, okay, you're basically now running an election. What's the cost of running an election? I think we have a pretty good sense of what that might be, but yeah. And I, and I think that, that that's part of our discussion in the ordinance committee was to get that in the new ordinance, or excuse me, the city charter to, to have a provision to do referendums. I think there are other cities around the state that have that that clause in their charter. And then there's still one more item off of Councilman Brittingham's list of questions. 
the plumbing schematics? Is there a way we can keep asking for those? Because I know we've asked several times for that, and we have not received anything from them. And part of that issue were the deck drains. What's that? Part of that issue with the plumbing was the deck drains, and I agree with you. And yeah. I think that they said they wouldn't have it until April or something like that. The, the deck, deck drains. drains. Oh. In, the, yeah. in, the, in the bays. So certainly they should be done with the schematics by this point. Would that be to let us know if, if they were willing to put Fox Glen on that system? Would that would the schematic tell us what plans they may have to expand the system? I think the idea would no, be. No, it's more, it's more what, what is going down the drain. It, is exactly. Because we've been told that only things that are going into our sewer system are the toilets, the sinks, the showers, the uh, reverse osmosis waste, and then the, forgot, what was the other one? Water softener. The water softener, thank you. The water softener waste. Those are the only in the kitchen and stuff like but that. So there's two streams, an yeah. industrial waste stream and a domestic waste stream. So the idea was, okay, what, w the reason we wanted to see the schematics, I believe, please correct me if I'm wrong, is okay, we have these bays that they're doing fabrication work and stuff like that. Where does that water go? Because they, de they do have deck drains. Does that go to the industrial side? Does that go to the domestic side? So, or okay, or how they've been telling us it goes to another system, but I don't know where that other system right. is. So the plumbing schematics that I had asked for and wanted to see are part of their architectural, you know, part of their actual site plan documents, their architectural documents that show, hey, where is this sink drain going to? Where is this floor From drain going Rockwell to? Plant. From the Rockwell plant. They're internal in their building. Okay. Okay. Um, there was a document that they submitted to the fire marshal's office uh, when they had 40% completed plans that show nine different rooms in the building with industrial drains, industrial floor drains. Um, but yet we've only been told of two pieces of their process that actually are supposed to tie into the industrial system. So what are those other drains and where do they tie into? Um, and that's what I kind of want to learn from those plumbing okay. schematics. Thank you for that clarification. Appreciate it. So if we could have staff ask again for direction. Yeah, and I, I think um, I mean, that the, the councilman has emailed well, over to the assistant utility manager. She, she did, she's going to follow up. Okay. So. Maybe my question is a little bit different then. I, is there a plan to try and include some of the areas of North Jefferson County on this sewer system? Yes. Like Fox Glen? Um, is not included. Yeah, I was gonna say I don't, I don't, I don't know the. Yeah, I mean I don't, I don't know the spe specifically. We did have a list. We but do I don't have know a if Fox Glen. Yeah, I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, we did provide a map at one point that showed the proposed line, the uh, developments that would tap in as they as they were developed. So I can get a copy of that map yeah, that, and get it out to the new members. Thank you. The majority of the properties are undeveloped currently. Right. So let me get the map for folks. Except for a few, a few, a few like small I think, users. I think, well, I think the high well, school. Well, the Burr Industrial high, Park would be the biggest. The Burr, yeah, there. Burr Park would be tied in. Uh, Jefferson High School, I believe, was going to get more capacity or something. Yeah, but I'll definitely get that as a reminder for the existing members and something for the new members. So you can see the map, the proposed route. But I, I definitely encourage the new members to go talk to CTUB and they will go over quite a bit of this with you. And they have it all there. Although it's 85% humidity over there right now. So. Or give me a call. Yeah, or give me I have a good memory. We can even schedule another presentation for the new members. Do it all at one time. Mm -hmm. Maybe they can have their answers to those questions at the same time. Nice. All right, so uh, at this point, we don't have a motion of any sort nope. on this issue. So what do we want to do? Well, I mean, we have some kind of questions out there. We've asked the city manager to get back to us on those. Um, we are missing one council member that I know, you know, is passionate about this topic. Um, I think we've at least gone over some questions that will give people, you know, some stuff to digest and research and think about to the next city council meeting. So at this point, I'll make a motion to table the uh, blue petition response. Seconded. 
I have a motion to second the table. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, the ayes have it. No opposed. <laughs> so, unanimous? I, yeah, I was going to say, I didn't, I didn't look up. Sorry. No opposed. That. Gotcha. Thank you. All right. So I'm saving, uh, let's do the, uh, the 3428 then, which is the uh, county parking lot negotiations. Council member Cradiville asked to have this put on the, uh, put on the agenda. I, I, I'd like to share an experience with you. I went, I signed up to do a race in Shepherdstown. And I hate to go to Shepherdstown because the parking's always so terrible. <laughs> but they had signs up that said free evening and weekend parking one of the lots from the university that they had negotiated a deal with the university. And I walked over there, parked my car, went to the race, had a great time, and didn't have to worry about it. So I think Shepherdstown, like Charlestown, has a parking perception problem as opposed to a real parking problem. And so I think it would be good if we could talk to the, uh, the county and see if we could do some signage and, and use their lot on weekends and evenings for free parking for people who want to do something downtown. Now, I know that, and, and I saw on the agenda that how you directed staff to do that, and I would like the, the council to uh, authorize the street committee, which I'm on, which means basically uh, I and whoever else would want to go with me, to just go talk to the county administrator and talk to the county commission. And I spoke to Judge Hammer, and he's got some interest in that too, since he works on Sunday evenings. And But he said... Yeah, let's let's think about working cooperatively with everybody. Because I mean, as you drive down Washington Street and you see that sign that's on the corner of the county building, you know, it's, it's almost like you're going they're going to put you in jail <laughs> if you park in their parking lot. Mm -hmm. Now, is that the friendly attitude that we want to show to people who come to Charlestown? Of course not. So I, I would like to have authority to try it again. I know mm -hmm. staff w yep. it, ran into some roadblocks, and uh, and obviously maybe they talked to the county administrator who is a very technical person and, and worries about things that maybe sometimes the county commission themselves wouldn't worry about. So I, I like to have the uh, sort of the sense of the commission that if, or the sense of the council, if everybody's interested in doing this, then authorize the street committee to. If I can interject one thing, I think uh, one of the holds ups, hold ups, one of the holdups is that they were, the county was supposed to do an MOU for us to consider and assign. I would recommend that we do the MOU and bring it to the county. If that's what we're waiting on, we can draft the MOU. Maybe that will facilitate them. It's an MOU. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Memorandum, Memorandum of understanding. understanding. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So, so does that make sense? Yeah, I, right. That That is the hang-up. I mean, I, the county commissioners have directed their staff to work with us to come to some sort of a mutual agreement. So they've already been instructed to do that. Um, and then they said they would take the lead on drafting an MOU with us. And, and we followed up with them a couple of times. It just hasn't happened yet. So, so maybe if we reverse that, if we were to develop the MOU okay. and kind of push it in their direction, maybe we can uh, kind of break this loose a little bit. So how about if we, how about if we do that and then we'll, we'll work with uh, the members of the street, street committee, committee just to kind of keep you informed. And if we need your help to, I don't know, encourage, we'll do that. <laughs> And if, if I could just make a suggestion, in the uh, agenda item, and I can't find which packet page it's on right now, um, but... It'd be nice if they had the pages on there. It sure would be nice. You got, you got that packet page? Page 30. No, I, I know what you're talking about. 30 for the county park and lot negotiations, yeah. packet page 30. Um, just trying to see it from their side when we do draft the MOU. Instead of saying, as well as provide minimal insurance coverage if necessary, <laughs> Probably better to say provide adequate insurance coverage. Or yeah. if I'm them, I'm like, well, wait a don't, minute. Don't we all have the same insurance company? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. Yeah, the everybody county. does. The county has the same insurance policy that the city has. Well, I think the idea is that they would want the city to supplement some of their insurance policy if we're going to, if it's going to kind of be under our control while people are parking there because they're worried that somebody, what happens if somebody trips during those hours and blah, blah, blah. Which are all yeah. generally very easy questions to fix with insurance companies. You just companies. get a thing for your insurance company that says, yeah. I mean, we do it for events all the time. Yep. It's not, it's not a big deal. Yeah, it's all, it's all, I thought it was all brim. It's not. You're a risk manager. It, it's pretty easy. It's certificate of insurance. Yeah. Right. So you're good on that then? I guess. Could I have one yeah, I think so. Absolutely. I know. To help 
answer some of your question. We, my department does a lot of the enforcement side uh, with hiring Mary uh, a little more eager. We're actually looking at our parking situation now, uh, you know, as far as our, the technology. We do have three parking lots currently in the city. Um, all of those are free after 5 o'clock, and they're all free on weekends. So we do have options there. We need to work on our signage, right. need, and that's part of the plan. You got it. Just nobody knows it. Right, and that's part of the parking stand they did a couple of years ago. Well, signage has been an issue for years. Mm -hmm. but, and that's going to be okay. some of my recommendations. I'm, I'm trying to work on as fast as I can to um, identify these and get it down on paper. I, I think streets is probably a good place to take that. Finance is going to be a good place to take this. For the signage? Uh, well, just the whole parking program in general. So I'm hoping sometime by the end of July I should have something put together. We're looking at the financial side of it. We're looking at what we need. We're looking at what's, um, you know, how to upgrade it, get into a parking app. Uh, so all that stuff we will be bringing to you uh, hopefully in the next few weeks. So I think we've been talking about signage and parking for a while. Mm -hmm. I mentioned it at a, at a public comment period in 2011. Oh, wow. So I myself. So yeah. Where are we at on that? Well, I mean, so, so parking, I think Chief covered kind of where, we, where he is, at least with this parking enforcement piece. Um, I just talked to our downtown coordinator this morning about it and said that signage is something I would want her to begin to focus on a little bit more, the downtown waste, uh, Wayfair signage. Um, yeah, wayfinding, wayfinding, wayfinding Fine. signs, sign, I'm sorry, way, yeah, right. wayfinding, wayfinding signs, yeah. Um, so, I'm, yeah, I think we need to make it a priority. We've definitely talked about it. We've put money in the budget to start to do it. We just haven't gotten to it, so this is a good reminder that we need kind to do that. Kind of have a holistic so, approach on yeah. the whole parking situation. So the, deal with this one parking lot, are we going to the streets committee? No, the, well, uh, so what, yeah, what I'll do is, again, we'll start to work on an MOU from our side. We'll brief the, the staff's going to do that, right? Yeah, we'll brief the street committee, keep the street committee informed on that, like I said. And do we need to refer to them? Well, I don't have it as a referral. We could um, refer to who, Mike? To the street committee. Refer the, refer the parking associations. I guess we have refer the county. Well, actually, we could do that. I mean, it's it's on the agenda. It wasn't under a referral, but right. as an action item, we could do that if we wanted to. Well, I, I move refer that we refer the county parking <coughs> negotiations to the streets committee. I'll second. <laughs> you didn't say ordinance, so I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a motion and a second. <laughs> um, any other discussion? No, I think that uh, I think we have a pretty clear idea of what we want. So basically, what you're saying is, what you the motion is, rather than the the staff doing the MOU, well, you would have the, the street committee doing the MOU. Staff will assist yeah. the street committee. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So there's no discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. It's unanimous. Mm -hmm. Chet's excited about that. Got it. Okay. So I think the second to the last item then is the filling the. Uh, plan for filling the mayoral vacancy. And I'll turn it over to. So I just wanted Carol. to provide an update. You stayed for right? Yeah. Yeah. We have a vacancy. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we're doing pretty good right now. We do. I appreciate it, guys. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to provide an update on where things stand. Uh, there is an action item at some point for this council to consider. Uh, the previous council basically agreed to to what you, what I'm handing out is the the filling the mayoral vacancy, a plan that was proposed on May 20th. Uh, the previous council agreed to basically the announcement process, which is kind of the process that we're in at the moment. Um, so that's basically what you'll see on page one. But what I've done is I've updated the schedule on page two. So if you flip the page over and just look at the schedule, skip the appointment process part. So June 14th, Mayor Rogers submitted his resignation. June 17th, we seated the new council members. Uh, on the 18th, the vacancy was posted on the city website and the Facebook page. Uh, for the next three weeks, it'll be printed in the spirit. Uh, and then letters of interest and other application materials are due to the city clerk on July 19th. So, so that's basically the, um, the announcement process. What I did is I tried to include some dates for what we might do after we get the materials, but um, 
Uh, that said, we did not as a council agree on the process after the applications were submitted. So um, I don't know that we're ready to have that conversation now. Uh, I don't necessarily have any recommendations. Um, but basically what I was suggesting is that when we got the applications, I would share them with the council members. You would have a little over two weeks to look at them. And then on August 5th, uh, the August 5th council <coughs> meeting, uh, we would decide how to proceed. Uh, do you want to interview all of the candidates, some of the candidates, none of the candidates? Um, do you want to select from that pool? Did you not want to select from that pool? I mean, again, uh, the process after the announcement is, is still up in the air for this council to decide. Um, well, I think that may be influenced by the number of applicants that we get. That we received. Have we any? Yeah. Good question. Have Pardon we me? received any? Have we, received we have not received any yet. We've had uh, one inquiry, which I do believe you know about, um, but no submissions. A quick question on your schedule. So August the 12th would be a special meeting then? If we did that, yeah. If we stuck to this schedule, the 12th is not a scheduled meeting date for the council. So nobody submitted yet? Well, not yet. I mean, you know, it's still got two and a half weeks. People, people have indicated interest, though. Yeah, I, we've got several people mentioned it to me. But yeah. I mean, I suspect we'll get some applications, but you're right. You, you never really know. You're surprised they weren't at meeting that day. Oh, was that time? Just process requires special <laughs> action by the council. <laughs> exactly. Not this evening. I think, again, I just wanted to give you an update on where we are in terms of, uh, of the announcement process. And so when we, like I said, on July 19th, when I get the applications, I'll share them with you. And uh, if it's okay with council, we'll schedule some time on the 5th to decide how to proceed. Yeah, I, I'm kind of conflicted as to whether or not we interview them. Mm -hmm. I don't know, me personally. <laughs> but one thing I do think is important is, is nailing down the actual way that we're going to select them. Um, for those of you ha that haven't been here for the appointment process yet, our current one is extremely awkward and, and strange and- But you didn't sit through mine, so. Yeah, it's not fun. Well, yeah, I didn't see. <laughs> mine was fun, right, Bob? The last way that you did it, though, made the that process, I thought, a lot less awkward and a lot easier and a lot just, it, it, it worked out much better. Um, I would like to see, I mean, is that enough time for you to kind of write down on paper how that works? Um, and that could not only be our process for this vacancy, but moving forward for various appointments. Because uh, I thought that was much better than any other, you know, time that we've appointed somebody. Yeah. Well, basically the process I used is spelled out in Robert's rules. So it's not something I made up. Uh, it's just. Photocopy it's, then. There you go. Um, <laughs> that was a written ballot. Is that right? Um, with the I mean, sort of. I mean, it, it was a ballot process. Yeah, that's what we call it. They call it a balloting a process. So basically you have nominations, and rather than, I think the old method is, somebody would sort of be nominated, nominated as right. the, the preferred choice, and you were voting up or down on that person. But the ballot process basically is you, you nominate the pool, you know, and then through a balloting process, you select the individual from among that group. Um, and that's what we did the last time, so seems to make sense yeah. the other way you almost you, you don't necessarily even get to ever vote on the person that you might have liked uh, this way you know Somebody whoever is qualified for the position can receive a vote from it you know anybody that wants to vote for them once the voting is done the votes are public so it's not they a secret public. ballot that's right it's not meant yeah. to be public. secret right but the only thing is we have to get a majority we you do well, I mean in order to appoint yeah you'd have to have a majority of members because if we have 20 people and we have yeah. Eight votes, or sorry, seven votes. <laughs> sorry. And there'll be a tie for last place. <laughs> mm-hmm. But then I guess you well, just well, do a the, process. Well, the chair the does vote in a ballot oh, process. Oh, the chair that's right. Votes. That's right. That's right. You don't and, and I mean, the, the votes aren't secret, and so if the first one we don't get to, you know, fifty percent majority or a majority for one of them, everybody's going to know who voted for who. Mm -hmm. More than likely, if you were to retake that vote. The outliers only got one or two, probably wouldn't receive any more votes. And the higher vote getters, somebody would probably more than likely vote for them. I think that's kind of how it's designed. I'm sure Roberts has a, a way of 
weeding it down if, if for some reason they're at deadlock? Yeah, I, I thought, um, actually, you're not supposed to eliminate anyone unless they choose to be eliminated. Correct. So even if somebody got one vote. You have to keep doing, you've got you have to, to keep, keep doing right. votes. But whoever voted for that person may decide, okay, this is not a viable candidate. I'm going to now shift my right. vote. Right, I remember that, yeah. Well, so yeah, I'll, uh, I'll start to articulate the ballot process a little more on here. Um, but we're all, we don't get any. <laughs> What's that? I said, we're just null and void if we don't get anybody the time. Well, that's the other thing too, I think. Uh, so if there are no viable or no candidates that, the co or let's say the candidate, come on, Bob. The council <laughs> rejects all the candidates that are put in there. I don't think necessarily a candidate has to be chosen from that pool. No, council, at the end of the day, the council selects. Right. So if you decide, um, I mean, the way I had written it up originally is that, yeah, you would consider the pool, and if you, did, you decided nobody was qualified, you would then set the process for how to do it again. And that process may be, okay, who are we going to vote for? I mean, it could be the group just deciding at that particular time, you know, that you want to select from among yourselves or whatever the case might be. Um, so... We, there, there's, yeah, I mean, whether we want to go back through a, an open application process would be your choice. Okay. Everybody's cool? Mm -hmm. Ready to move on? And then we have the last thing is the Blue Ridge Watershed Coalition. Are you here for the Blue Shed Coalition? Okay. Good. No, okay, okay. And I was going to apologize to for making you wait so long. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, uh, welcome. <laughs> okay. Don't trust us. We like to talk. All right, Blame so, it on the city council. <laughs> so, uh, so Mr. Maxey is not oh, here. On. So uh, let's just keep this on the table, and I'll follow up with him for the next meeting. All right with that? Yep. Okay. And the final is the approval of the bills. I'll make a motion to approve the bills. And I'll second. I have a motion to second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's unanimous. I have a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right, we're out of here. Can we stay here for the next?